welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we might genuinely have one of the most jam-packed episodes of major fantasy news uh, I have ever covered, which means I'm probably going to be putting out this episode a bit early just so I can be getting this flood to you. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into some major adaptation news, shifting things around a little bit, and we'll do the cover uh, reveals at the end. So kicking it off first, very excitingly, we are getting another Wheel of Time adaptation. Apparently there is going to be a movie adaptation of the Wheel of Time that is going to take place in the Age of Legends. With Ava Longoria executive producing and director Carrie Scogland attached, this is going to be the first installment in a planned trilogy of films. With a quote from the director saying, directing the Age of Legends is a remarkable opportunity opportunity to bring a beloved universe to life and delve into rich lore that has long captivated the hearts of millions of book readers around the world. Now, just to put things in perspective, we actually covered this movie's announcement all the way back in 2021. The real update here is that a director is officially attached. Yeah, Hollywood is a bit slow and sometimes these projects do just disappear. So it's kind of difficult when things like this are announced to know if they'll actually come to fruition. But here with a director and the same writer attached, this does seem to actually be making progress. Now, if you're paying attention, there's a little bit of an MCU crossover here because not only is Scoglin directed Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but the screenplay is penned by Zach Stentz who worked on Thor, X-Men First Class, and Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. But that's not Scoglin's most impressive credit, in my opinion. She was also a director for Handmaid's Tale, House of Cards, The Americans, and The Punisher. Now, unfortunately, Iwat Entertainment does still have their name attached, formerly known as Red Eagle Entertainment. They just seem to have glommed themselves onto this franchise for the long haul. This does have a whole lot of the team involved in the production side that is behind the Amazon show as well. The Amazon show, I think, did better in season two than in season one, but I'm still nervous right now as a fan to see any new adaptations, live action or animated for The Wheel of Time. That being said though, this is a solid director and the best adaptation we as fans have received of The Wheel of Time is those shorts that we're looking into some of the tales and the foundations of The Wheel of Time. So I have some hope. How I feel about this is I just really don't know. We're in a day and age of adaptation where until you see a trailer, there's so many unanswered questions that could flow around. Is this going to embrace the visual language of Amazon's show or try and do something entirely different? Is this going to be like Hobbit to the Lord of the Rings or a entire reimagining and reinterpretation? Are they going to use some of the same actors that have already been shown in the Age of Legends? I do not know, but I will absolutely be covering any developments that do arise. Next news. And that is going to be that we are also getting a Murderbot adaptation greenlit yet again. It was halted a little bit by the strikes that happened, but now we know who is going to be in the starring role and writing, directing, and producing. And the starring role is going to Alexander Skarsgård, who you might know from this resume, with Chris and Paul White serving as producers, writers, and directors under their production company, Depth of Field. This is such an interesting announcement because the casting of Murderbot has been a gargantuan unanswered question for the franchise since essentially it started being murmured that it could be adapted. With Murderbot not having a specific gender and its personality being that of a robot, you'll see fans casting everyone from Aubrey Plaza to Christian Bale to take on the role and a substantial amount of people saying yeah that could work that could be a good casting everybody's a suspect Alexander Skarsgård though is a big enough name in Hollywood though that I'm just excited to see him involved with the project he brings in credibility and likely access to greater promotion and fan base than a lot of other people possibly could so neat he's not my personal first choice but it's not a casting that like revolts me in any way shape or form Alexander Skarsgård kicks ass the bigger question for for me though is Paul and Chris White's. Uh, I wasn't super familiar with their work and so I did a little bit of a deep dive before recording this and to say they have a checkered resume would be accurate and that they're tonally very wild is also so. So whether or not they are the right visionaries to take on this series, I have no idea. I'd have to talk with them and see how they interpret Murderbot. But Apple is a company that, at least from the shows I have seen from them and liked, does strike the proper production environment for Murderbot, in my opinion. They've handled Silo extremely well. Foundation, from what I understand, is doing a lot better now. Severance is fantastic. And with Murderbot having this kind of corporate robot dry aesthetic per 
permeating throughout it. I think Apple ordering a 10 episode sci-fi drama series is a really good pick. Certainly gives it more hope that could go on for additional seasons than if it was picked up by Netflix. Let's kill it! Now in just as big adaptation news that seems to be a bit earlier on in the process, Tad Williams' Other Land has also been announced to be attempt to be adapted. The reason I add those caveats is they're still so early on in the process that they're looking to interview showrunners and screenwriters. But the production companies Platige Image and Mount Devil have partnered with Mark Webber to attempt to adapt the four book series by Tad Williams as a TV series. Making a statement about the project, Webber said, I believe Tad has written the definitive works on the conflict between the human experience and technological advancement. He depicts a not so distant future where the choices between living in the real or virtual world become a choice between life or death. The prescient themes and fantastic characters give Otherland all the foundations of a next level sci-fi drama series adaptation. Now, Tad Williams has been a big name in sci-fi fantasy for a long time, and as far as I'm aware, has never let any of his series, even Memory Sorrow Thorn, be adapted. So this is surprising and really cool news for Tad Williams fans. And the fact that it's not Memory Sorrow Thorn, instead is Otherland is curious to me, but equally exciting. I'd love to see how this can be brought to life, though keep in mind, this is very early on in the process. There is a distinct difference between green lighting, in production, and all these other terms you hear thrown around in Hollywood. I will try and always let you know the chances of something actually happening. All the adaptations we've talked about here today, Murderbot is the one that seems most likely to actually get done and on your screens in the shortest amount of time, in my gut feeling. Just a guess. But that is not the end of the major adaptation news, my God. God! Because Will White has taken to Twitter to officially announce it is happening. We are finally animating Cradle. Now, the reason I've separated this out to be at the end is it is very dependent on how well the Kickstarter Will White is launching for this project performs. If it does not perform great, this will be a more held back, smaller animation. If it blows it out of the water and raises millions, it looks like they'll be trying to do the big budget animated adaptation for the Cradle series. And notably, he already has a big name attached to this project in the animation space, Jay Oliva who worked on notable titles like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns and the Flashpoint Paradox adaptation. Good lord, that's a name to have. God damn, Will White. The Kickstarter will officially be launching January 15th next year, and you can already sign up for the pre-launch page as many Kickstarters do have. I will be keeping a very close eye on this project because I think it's a really cool ambition, and I love that we are now in the day and age where, yes, we can talk about the big studio adaptations and all of that, but if an author has managed their brand enough and engaged with their fans enough, they could also just take this route. And we don't know how successful or unsuccessful this side of production is going to evolve to be over the years. It's certainly kind of new still, uh, but if there's someone who I think is passionate enough to, about their own series to do it well, Will White stands at the top of the crowd. And then finally, of course, we have to talk about the another major adaptation announced Good God! And that is going to be that the anime for One Piece isn't restarting, but instead just starting another one. Yes, the anime has been running so long that you likely are going to be feeling nostalgic for a show that's still going on. Anyway, it seems that Wit Studios, best known in my experience at least for their adaptation of Attack on Titan, is now going to be tackling at least the East Blue for One Piece. And this has fans both hesitant and excited. I agree with like the sentiment stated here, but at the same time, Wit Studios is incredible. And the fact that they're starting this late in the One Piece series means they likely will not have to start bloating themselves out and murdering their own pacing just so they don't overtake the manga, which has happened with the current on running anime. I still like the current anime. Every now and then I will just throw on an episode of a chapter I read in the manga just to see how they're doing it and really love it. But it's undeniable at various points to varying degrees that anime has struggled. And I hope it never is viewed negatively and fans don't abandon it for anything else. But at the same time, I'm really excited to see a new interpretation of bringing uh, One Piece to the animated screen again in a way that is going to not suffer in the same ways that the One Piece anime did early on from its production not having the most resources. Again, no disrespect to that creative team and what they've accomplished 
accomplished. I think the One Piece current anime is great, but I can't help but be excited for this new hotness too. I guess my final feeling on the matter is the East Blue is big enough for two animes to exist, and with the current just influx of interest going on in the West for One Piece, uh, this franchise is not going to be going away anytime soon at all. And I actually do think there's a market for this because it's really hard to convince a Western viewer to just pick up a manga for something that's well over a thousand chapters now and start reading it. It's hard to get them to watch an anime that has well over a hundred episodes per arc sometimes. And so something that's going to be more visually beautiful from Go, that's going to be able to then tackle the pacing in a stronger way, that has commercial value. That is something that could be good for the franchise as a whole, especially with a studio like this behind it. And then finally, huh? Chainsaw Man has a movie announced as well, titled Chainsaw Man Movie. Rez, Rez, I don't, I'm not sure I haven't kept up with Chainsaw Man in a minute, is currently being worked on. But that's not the weirdest thing being adapted. You thought we were done? No, I wasn't kidding. This might be the most loaded episode of fantasy news ever. It's over when I say it's over. And that is because A24 of all people is apparently going to be adapting Death Stranding, which, like at, at my initial feeling was like, ah, oh, that's, no, actually that completely fits. <laughs> it's like when you see two foods that shouldn't work together combined and you're like, actually, oh no, wait, that's probably gonna be really, really good. Like the first time I saw bacon and chocolate, I was like, ah, oh, no, that sounds awesome. That's a thing. In two last minute fantasy news updates, we also had the release date for Stormlight 5 confirmed. Well, we theorized here on the channel it would be December 7th before it has been confirmed that Stormlight 5 Wind and Truth will be released Friday, December 6th in 2024, which is a little bit sooner and is still going to be a bit of an experiment that I'm still excited to watch because it's not going to be on a typical release day. Very cool. And then the final update, the lawsuit we talked about for quite some time where a person was suing both the Tolkien estate and Amazon claiming that Rings of Power stole from them despite their book taking heavily from Tolkien. Uh, yeah, they lost and apparently the judge called their entire suit frivolous and is now making them compensate the Tolkien estate and Amazon for legal fees. It takes a lot for me to be on the side of Amazon. And uh, yeah, this dude's lawsuit was that frivolous that I'm actually on the side of Amazon. Oh my God. Now we're going to be shifting out of the adaptation news finally and instead talking about some good old book news. And this is actually going to be industry book news I'm really excited about because it seems the prediction that print books would go the way of the dodo in the future isn't actually holding up at all because book sales are up between 10 to 14 percent over three years in most English speaking markets. This is probably for a lot of reasons. One, there's a boom of books just being viewed as cool or aesthetically pleasing to have in your house. And while that's not the intent of books, uh, I have no problem with that because it means authors are getting sales. On top of that, and I think actually in my conspiracy mind, the most intense uh, reason for any of this, e-readers have failed. Like to me, don't get me wrong, there are some good e-readers out there that are not bloated with ads, but so many of them from the biggest e-reader name providers on the market are a pain in the ass to read on and filled with distractions. They've just become another screen that's going to advertise you things and provide distractions you're likely trying to get away from on the same device uh, rather than just being a book. And for that reason, I know so many people who refuse to go to e-readers, not because they're not admittedly more convenient. You can have thousands of books in something that weighs a fraction of a gargantuan hardback, but that is completely overshadowed by the inconvenience of having to be told, ah, oh, you're not seeing the new Rebel Moon trailer and you could actually watch Netflix on this. Do you wanna watch Netflix? Oh, okay, and you gotta plug it into charge because it's not a battery efficient screen anymore that can last for days and days and days and days and days and days and days without charging that only refreshes once every a long time so you can just keep reading a book, but instead has a high end refresh rate that's going to murder the battery and you can't just throw it in your bag and forget about it for a week. You gotta keep charging it. That sucks. 
E-readers suck. I can't believe I'm saying this. I thought they would be the future of reading at some time. No, they're pretty bad. I'm sure there's gonna be some people recommending some actually pretty good ones in the comments down below. Go check them out. I have not come across those, but what I am just saying is the big ones that are pushed on the market by companies that can afford massive marketing campaigns are usually then filled with things to justify those companies pushing those massive marketing campaigns. And that's not just straightforward reading books. It's disgusting. Now it is specifically noted in this article as well that a lot of these books that are still selling in print uh, are genre or romance. Like they're either sci-fi, fantasy, or romance. And I think that's just indicative of also the times that we're in. We're constantly inundated by negative news, down feeling things about the world. And so yeah, escapism to a better world and more adventurous life is gonna continue to have its appeal and maybe more so than ever right now. That's maybe me reaching a little bit too much there, but I don't know. This article just gave me a really good opportunity to say how e-readers have turned out, right? But while we're talking about certain companies that have not handled e-readers great, totally unrelated, uh, Amazon is officially launching what is being touted as a competitor to Goodreads, a website it owns. Now, when I first read this headline, I initially just thought, yeah, that's completely something Amazon would do. Amazon would just be like, yeah, we bought this thing, but screw it. Here's the new thing, especially because Goodreads has just been viewed more and more negatively over the years. But now that I've looked into what this website actually is, or really just an additional feature on the existing Amazon website, I don't think it's actually going to compete with Goodreads as aggressively as it's being touted. Clicking through it, it's really just all the books you've read and then recommending you other books you might be interested in because of that. And the reviews you'll see on this website are coming from Amazon reviews, which I don't really think anybody considers to be a great place to go for uh, reviews on a book. Like of the list of things, like even Goodreads is a little bit down for me in terms of finding like a trusted good review for many reasons we've talked about recently here on the channel. But like even below that would be the review section for a book on Amazon? That's disgusting. Really the focus for this website is discovering and buying new books on the platform because that's what Amazon always wants you to do. It does not have a book review bend to it. So I just don't see this causing a mass exodus from Goodreads happening. Though I would like to see that happen, but I promised it and now let's deliver it. Let's go ahead and get into the cover reveals for the day. It feels nice to end in a comfy, cozy space of fantasy news because the first cover reveal we're gonna be talking about is for the runes, not rules, of engagement by Dave Kletcha and Tobias S. Buckle. All initiative, no dice. Pitched as the Lord of the Rings meets Slaughterhouse Five in this delirious mashup, pitting US military against legendary monsters from fantasy novels and role playing games, from a science fiction award winner and ex Marine and extreme amateur landscaper, comes a righteous fantasy military science fiction adventure that will delight fans of Terry Pratchett, J.R.R. Tolkien, and John Scalzi. And this will be released June 18th. Of 2024. And I kind of really dig this cover. It's apparently going for like a goofier vibe, but this cover does not look goofy at all. We've seen the uh, like US military versus fantastical creatures uh, trope done before, but I always kind of enjoy it, especially if it leans into the schlockier, funnier side of it. The first time I ever encountered like US military versus fantastical thing though, was actually a like, copy pasta, not copy, I don't know the word for it, but something on Reddit that was the US military going back in time and fighting like Roman legions. And then it, if I remember correctly, evolved in them fighting like Roman mythological things. And I, I read that and I thought that was really cool. And I've always wanted to pick up another story that just kind of hit that vein. And this, I mean, goddamn Marines shooting at a giant dragon seems like it's gonna be having some of the same appeal. Also runes of engagement combined with all edition of no dice. This is going for a vibe and it's it's succeeding. And thank you for crediting your cover artist in your announcement. The cover artist is Andre Willen. And then in another cover reveal, we had The Fire Within Them by Matthew Ward, the sequel to The Darkness Before Them which will be published June 13th of 2024. And I like actually some of the smaller details in this cover. I like that we're at a bit of a lower perspective and it looks like there's some like slight lens warp happening where everything has a bit of a curve to it. That's neat because it immediately makes me as a reader think like, is that because this character bathed in flame, like walking down the stairs is so powerful, like reality is bending to them. It just adds 
something. It's a creative choice that on a more minimal cover, I don't know if I've seen before. Like there's a lot of white space. This is the most detailed cover, yet they've put something in here I normally only see on detailed covers that I think is working quite well. That with a strong color palette choice, this is a damn good cover. And this is with art by Joe Wilton, which they did not include in the tweet, but they did include on the website. But before we close out the fantasy news today, we're gonna do a quick shout out to a book published by a goblin from within the Horde. Take it away, past Daniel. And for this week's indie self-pub promo, we have Whispers of a World Breaker, book one in the Elmerian Chronicles by Corey Ratif, pitched as for fans of the Dragon Rider trope who wished they'd get to see an adult version. Eric's job is simple, assist the elves as they moved dragon eggs across the kingdom. When an orc raid leaves a dragon in peril and her egg vulnerable, the responsibility falls into Eric's hands to complete the mission. But when the dragon hatches, Eric's life is thrown into disarray. Accused of being the world breaker of an old prophecy by the elves, sought after by the ever-growing orc clans as vengeance against the elves, and desired by the human kings and queens for power, Eric will stop at nothing to protect his new dragon. It may be the only thing that can turn the tides of the war. Available at the links in the description. And this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. If you'd like to see any additional Fantasy News stories covered next week, go ahead and join the Discord server and post them in the Fantasy News channel, and there's a chance I just might be talking about it right here next week. Have a good one, y'all. Peace! And of course, I want to record a special shout out to my latest high tier patrons, Jason Ashmore, Friororf Hansen, Chelsea Dole, Cody, original username, nice, and Dax Dibble.